residents. Louder, Ellen Malfers. Please, a little louder. Okay. Is that better? Yes. Okay. All right. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Uh, as part of our sixth annual Pat Connery Literary Festival, we are honored today to host uh, USC's Beaufort writer and residence Ellen Malfers this afternoon as she interviews best selling novelist Wally Cash, and they'll be discussing his new novel, When Ghosts Come Home. A little bit about our interviewer, Ellen Mal Malfers. She lives and writes beside the May River in her native South Carolina low country and beneath the mountains of western Montana. She studied under James Dickey and was also mentored by her beloved friend, Pat Conroy. She is a professor of English and the writer in residence at the University of South Carolina, Beaufort, as well as deputy director of the annual Pat Conroy Literary Festival. Her debut novel, Untying the Moon, was published by Pat Conroy's Story River Books. Malfress's fiction, poetry, essays, and articles have appeared in publications including Southern Literary Journal, Review of Contemporary Fiction, William and Mary Review, James Dickey Review, Kate Ashbury Review, Georgia Poetry Review, Essence of Beaufort in the Low Country, SCG Lifestyle Magazine, and our print subscribes, Writers Remember Pat Conroy. She is most at home in nature and her concern for wild places and creatures, particularly when it comes to coastal conservation, is evident in the fabric of her writing. About our author, Wiley Cash, who is the New York Times bestselling author of A Land More Kind Than Home. He's been a fellow at Iado and the McDowell Colony, and he teaches fiction, writing, and literature at the University of North Carolina, Asheville, where he serves as author in residence. His new novel, When Ghosts Come Home, will be available September 21st, published in October 2017. Cash's novel, The Last Ballad, was an American Library Association Book of the Year and the Chicago Public Library Best Book of 2017. The novel received the Southern Book Prize, also the Sir Walter Raleigh Award for Fiction, the Weatherford Award, and the Blood Root Mountain Prize. Uh -huh. His second novel, This Dark Road to Mercy, was a national bestseller and received the Crime Writers Association's Novel of the Year in the United Kingdom. It was a finalist for both the Edgar Award for Best Novel and the Southern Book Prize. Cash's debut novel, A Land More Kind Than Home, won the Thomas Wolfe Book Prize, the Maine Reader's Choice Award, the Southern Book Prize, the Crooks Corner Book Prize, and the Appalachian Writers Association Book of the Year. Also, the Crime Writers Association's debut of the year in the UK. The novel was a finalist for the American Booksellers Association debut of the year in the Penn Robert W. Bingham Prize. Cash has also received the Pat Conroy Legacy Award from the Southern Independent Booksellers Alliance and the Appalachian Heritage Prize from Shepherd University. Cash lives in North Carolina with his wife, photographer Mallory Cash, and their two daughters. Please, everyone, let's welcome Ellen and Wally as our panelists this afternoon. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you, Brooke. And now, I hate to tell y'all, sitting out there with your masks on, the great unveiling. <laughs> How's that for volume? Everybody's good? Okay. How many of you have read a Wiley Cash book, or is this your first introduction? All right, most everybody. And have you gotten a chance yet to look at the new book. Okay. Well, those of you who have had the chance to start into it are the great good fortune to have already fin finished it. Enough. Jonathan, we seem to be glitching out. I'm not moving the mic, but the volume is cutting in and out somehow. Of course, it's not Is it just you or is it wild? I think it's just her. <laughs> But I haven't talked very much, so we'll see. All right, we'll give this one a shot. So, as some of you know, and all of you will know, 
in this book, we have, we have come down from Western North Carolina, Central North Carolina. We have come down from Appalachia and, and through that central section where Gastonia is, where we've spent time with others of Wiley's characters, and here we are on the coast. So I want to ask you about that geographic shift and if that has been a long time in the coming, how it felt, was it more comfortable writing more westward, or let's talk about geography. So uh, first of all, thank you for doing this with me, Ellen. And, and thank you all for coming out on, on a rainy day. Y'all might have just come out to experience a little bit of cold. Y'all don't get that too often. <laughs> you might have thought, oh, I'm gonna leave home today. Um, so, you know, most of my books are set Gastonia West, as you mentioned, and uh, I was raised in Gastonia, went to school up in Asheville. One of my classmates from UNC Asheville, Meredith Newland, is here, which is great. Um, and we moved, uh, I left North Carolina in 2003 and went to graduate school in Louisiana. And I had never really lived outside the state before. And when I went to Louisiana, I was really homesick for, for the mountains of North Carolina where I had spent the most time. And so I rode a land more kind than home uh, living in Louisiana. And then I got a job teaching my first tenure track, te my only tenure track teaching job was at a college in West Virginia called Bethany College. So I moved up to West Virginia in 2008 and um, I wrote This Dark Road to Mercy up there, uh, which is set in Gastonia. And then we moved back to North Carolina. My wife got a job in Wilmington, and she's from Wilmington originally. And my, my, my parents had actually left Gastonia and moved down to Oak Island, where my new novel is set in 1998. Um, and so when we got back to Wilmington in 2013, I was working on The Last Ballad. The Last Ballad is the first book that I wrote while living in North Carolina which was great because it was a, based on a true story. I got to go to the places it's set, do the research, go to the archives, you know, kind of reimmerse myself in that landscape. But when it came time to write a fourth book, which I was under contract to do, uh, I decided I was gonna set it in the Eastern part of North Carolina for a couple of reasons. The, the easiest way to answer that is I heard a story about an aircraft that crash landed uh, in Oak Island at, the, at this airport that I write about that was too large for the runway and they had to hire a pilot to come get the air, aircraft off the runway. So I thought, that's a cool setup for a novel. Mm -hmm. um, and then when we moved down to Wilmington in 2003, I mean in uh, 2013, it felt so foreign to me. Uh, I didn't grow up around boat culture. I didn't grow up around the ocean. I, I didn't grow up in that, that landscape or that geography or that kind of coastal culture. And so it took me a long time, and I, and I think I'm still doing it, um, trying to find my way into the community there, you know, uh, especially with people who are from there. And then realizing that my wife is of this place, um, drew some distinctions between us you know, uh, culturally, geographically, you know, things like that. And then we had two children. We have, uh, we have two little girls, seven and five, uh, who are in kindergarten and first grade. And it dawned on me that the three most important people in my life are of a place that I am not of. And, you know, I think when you're a parent, and, and I can't speak for everyone, maybe some of y'all don't have the ego that I have, um, but you want your, your children's childhood to be like yours. As if you had a good childhood, and I did, I had a great childhood. We played in the woods, there were creeks, there were lakes, there were ponds, there were hills, there were, you know. Um, but my children's childhood is the beach, uh, terrifying weeds, live oak trees, Spanish moss, um, very, very few differentiation between seasons. Mine was not like that. Um, and so, I, I have, I nurture this fear that, or I have this fear that eventually my life and my children's lives are going to go in opposite directions. Our understanding of the world is gonna be different because of where we're from. Ron Rash, who I know all of y'all are familiar with, says that landscape is destiny, that where you are from and what you are of somehow cements your understanding of the world. And, and I think that's true, and, and, it, and it might be true of my, my children and it might be true of me, and so I thought, if I'm gonna understand this place to even try to be on the level where they're gonna get it automatically, um, I need to write about it. And so writing about uh, Eastern North Carolina, Southeastern North Carolina, 
in about the, I decided to write about it in about the moment that I became aware of history, politics, culture, and that was in 1984. I was seven. Uh, Ronald Reagan was running for a second term, and that was a that was the first cultural moment that I can remember, looking around and, and knowing who politicians were, or knowing campaign slogans, or knowing. Bruce Springsteen's Born in the USA, and, and kind of looking around and having a feeling for the political cultural weather uh, for the first time, which is very similar to how my, my children, both of them felt when I was writing this book in 2020, we're in a major election season, they're old enough to listen to the radio, they're old enough to overhear adult conversation, um, they're old enough to have questions. Um, and so it just felt like a good way to try to go and investigate my own coming of age and then kind of parallel it with theirs. And did you find that the characters on the east coast of North Carolina were more difficult to write about or are they just people? How, what's the difference in writing, writing about the peop your people? Yeah, people? that's a good question. You know, I write mostly about rural people and you know, I guess, I guess God didn't like that response. I was like, we're gonna turn the lights off on that one. Um, I mostly write about rural people, and so rural people are largely the same everywhere. Their concerns are economic, their concerns are class-based, their concerns are you know, regional. Um, and so that wasn't very difficult, but I, 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 I shortcutted some of it by having my protagonist not be from the area. He's from Gastonia, where I'm from. And so he kind of intuits, hey Sandy, he kind of intuits that he's an outsider um, in some way, right? And so that's very much how I felt. And so it was made it a little bit easier to, to write the book with that in mind. Okay. Let's go back to the 1984 thing. Okay. A, cu a couple of things about that. You've said that was your you know, first time of, of coming of age, being aware. It's not lost on us that you're writing it in 2020 and many of the concerns of 1984 are the concerns of 2020. Politicians are just as scummy and <laughs> race relations are just as touchy. Um, social justice issues are important in this book. The race relations are extremely important in this book. Want to touch on that a little bit? Sure, yeah. You know, in 1984, when I was coming of age, I was raised by really conservative parents. And so our the Mount Rushmore of my youth was Ronald Reagan, Jesse Helms, uh, Richard Petty, and Dean Smith, <laughs> Carolina Tar Heel basketball coach. And um, I think two of them still belong there. Uh, when I when I look back on my childhood, and I'll let y'all decide who I think those probably are. Um, but, you know, I, I grew up, kind of um, having very inherited opinions about certain cultural things. And, um, you know, I was, I was raised hearing, you know, um, it's morning in America, the city on a hill, um, born in the USA, right, Bruce Springsteen. But if you peel back the facade of that era or the, you know, shellacking or the patina, or however you want to refer to it, you know, Born in the USA is about the hollowing out of the Rust Belt economy. It's not a, it's not an anthem of like American pride. And and Reagan didn't listen to that song either because he put it in his campaign, right? <laughs> um, the opening line of that is, "I was born down in a dead man's town," right? And that's not like bootstraps. That's like shoeless. Um, and you know, while the campaign slogans are "City on a Hill" and "Morning in America," it's the beginning of the crack epidemic. We have the AIDS epidemic in full swing. And I didn't know about any of these things because it was morning in America. I didn't know about any of that. And of course, you know, the, 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 the stance of history looking back, it's easier to discern those things, especially when you leave home and you get a little bit older. Because um, I was raised in a community where so many things were implied. You know, where I was from in Gastonia, this old mill town, if you were white, you were, you could, you could assume to be conservative. You, that's just an assumption. If you were conservative, you were Baptist. If you were Baptist, you were this. And it's, you know, all these Venn diagrams and my family was very much at the center. And so we, I never had uncomfortable conversations. Um, 
because my environment, my community, there was no one to have those conversations with. It was just what it was, you know? I mean, even something like P the PTL scandal with Jim and Tammy Faye, the only uncomfortable conversations we had about that was things that I just shouldn't have heard as a eight-year-old, right, or a nine-year-old. But nobody, you know, the way people describe that was, you know, the devil's working on Jim Baker, right? And in reality, it's like, no, he was just not a very good person. The devil might have been like, I'm going to stay home. Jim's got this. Jim's all right. I'm going to leave him alone. Um, and so we never had tough conversations. But then flash forward to 2020, these implicit cultural beliefs or political attitudes were so much more explicit. You wore a certain kind of hat, right? You put a certain kind of sign in your yard. You wore a mask. You got a vaccine. And these were shorthand for political cultural beliefs. And it was interesting paralleling these two moments. And, you know, there is a... And we don't want to have tough conversations. And so we see somebody wearing a certain hat or we see somebody not wearing a mask. And we think, oh, thank God you've got that on or off. So now I don't have to talk to you, right? Um... And, and we all do it uh, on whatever side of the issue we're on. Um, but we didn't do that in the 1980s. And um, there's a scene in my novel, and when ghosts come home, it's, the, it's my favorite scene in the book, um, where the sheriff is um, in his office and he learns that there's been a night ride in, this, in the black community the night before. And that citizens have been calling in, like trying to get help, trying to get somebody out there. And the day after, they're still calling in, leaving messages, you know, why isn't the sheriff calling us back? And um, what the leader of, this, of the community comes in and he confronts the sheriff and says like, man, I gotta hear from you. And the sheriff says, well, I didn't get any of these messages. And he goes out and, and asks his secretary, you know, why didn't you give me this guy's messages about this night ride last night? And the secretary says, because there's no law against driving around. And in that moment, the sheriff realizes after knowing this woman for two decades, like, oh my gosh, that's who you are. And I've worked with you side by side and I've never thought to broach this topic because I would just never assume because you're so nice, because you pray for my wife, because you bring us food, because I know your husband, that this would ever be a, 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 a wedge between us. Um, and I think a lot of us have had that experience, you know, you know, was January 6th an assault on democracy or was it a regular tourist visit? There's people in our families who have an opinion one way or another. And, and we may say, how can you believe that? And they'll say, well, how can you believe that? And, um, and so I was, I was, I was putting those, those two historical moments side by side and just drawing connections and, and trying to make, you know, the, the, the story feel real and urgent and alive as, as much as I could. So the scope of your writing, the, the first two books, you know, you were focusing on the set of brothers and then well, the little girls and, and the errant father, but highly personal, intensely personal. And then with Ella Mae Wiggins in The Last Ballad, the, the scope is getting wider and taking on issues and social issues and for me in this new book we're really widening up all these social justice issues that the scope is getting bigger and bigger is that has that been intentional or has it just happened organically i think it just kind of happens organically you know i think that i think it's true of a lot of us that our first attempt at writing fiction is probably going to be our most autobiographical attempt i think we can look back historically and that's probably true of most of most writers. Um, and, uh, or maybe not, I don't know, the light went out, I don't know. Um, but, uh, I guess we're, maybe we're not moving enough. This looks like a boardroom in a bank with like uh, motion sensor lights. Um, you know, I, but I think that my first novel was probably the most autobiographical. It's set in 1986, you know, uh, I, the, the main character's nine. I was nine in 1986. It involves kind of the fall of the Southern Evangelical. That, that, that's what I was seeing in 1986. Um, 
And so, you know, oftentimes first novels are also written in first person um, because it's as if the, the, the character or the author are talking directly to the reader. And, and, and that's also harder than I think we assume it to be when we set out to do it as well, uh, that, to maintain that first person plausibility to, to continue the, the dream of fiction. So my first two books were tight. They were, I had never written a novel before. The first novel I wrote is my first published novel, and I'm very lucky that that worked out for me. Um, and so my first two novels are similar in that they're these tightly drawn little mousetraps of, of time, um, of characters, um, of trampolines of causality, you know, kind of moving the reader through it. And I cut my teeth on those first two books, and I'm really proud of them. I think that they're, um, they're emblematic of my capabilities when I was writing them. But The Last Ballad was a novel idea that I had before those first two. Um, I learned about the 1929 mill strike in my hometown of Gastonia. I didn't learn about it when I lived in Gastonia. I learned about it when I went to graduate school in 2003 in Louisiana. And somebody mentioned it, and I had never learned that one of the most significant labor movements in American history had happened in my hometown and involved the mills, which all of my family comes from the mills, the farms and then the mills. And so I wanted to write that novel, but I knew it was going to be a larger, more expansive novel, and I didn't have the, the literary chops or really the, the research capabilities to take that on when I was in graduate school and I was doing all these other things. But by the time I wrote The Last Ballad, I was only writing. I wasn't teaching. We didn't have children yet. Um, and I had more time on my hands to really write a big, messy book. And, and that's what The Last Ballad is, uh, especially when I was writing it, it was very messy. And I think of that book as, every, as, as being representative of everything I can do as a writer. I mean, that's everything I can do as a writer, is in, is in that book. Um, and uh, when it came time to do, uh, when ghosts come home, it, you know, stories have a strange way of finding you and you write responding to the moment. You know, there was the, the, the murder of Maude Aubrey, the, the, the trial's about to start. Uh, this was the young black man in, in, in Georgia who was shot down because he had been on a construction site during the daytime um, while jogging through a neighborhood. And when I was a kid growing up in Gastonia, and I talk about this oftentimes when I teach, um, on Sunday, Sundays we'd go to church, we'd go to the Cracker Barrel, and then we would drive around and look at houses we couldn't afford. And if there was a house under construction, the whole family got out and we went in. Nobody ever shot us, shot at us, asked us any questions or anything. Because my dad loved looking at houses under construction and trying to figure out how they work. And I tell that story in relation to how I teach craft. You know, how does a story work? Well, let's touch the story, let's take it apart. That's what my dad did. You know, he would touch things in the house under construction to figure out how they worked. But I was thinking about when Arbery was killed, like that never even crossed my mind. And, and I grew up in a neighborhood in Gastonia where the, um, the woods behind our house were bulldozed and big homes were built. And we did all kinds of things back there in that development. Um, some of them untoward, right? And nobody ever came for us. Nobody ever called the police. Nobody ever did anything. And so there is some of that in this book. There's a, there's a, a land developer who's drained wetlands and he's putting in McMansions. And there's some kids who don't like it. And there's some racialized violence that comes as a result of that. And, and maybe that was a response to Ahmaud Arbery. Maybe it was a, a memory that I had of, of doing, you know, dangerous things in housing developments. Um, but, you know, the book finds a way of, of, of finding you um, where you are. And this novel, When Ghosts Come Home, I think packs the combustible energy of my early, my first two books and the, um, the kind of narrative propulsion, I hope, is there. Um, but I think it also has the cultural relevance, maybe not the historical relevance, but the cultural relevance of The Last Ballad and some of its discussions about gender and racial dynamics and the weight of history, the roles of fathers and daughters in those relationships. Um, you know, I wanted to write a really fast moving book. That's what I set out to do because I, I felt like I hadn't done that. And I thought, you know what, I'm gonna write a slick crime novel. And then I'm a year in and I've got all these characters and my editors asking me, you know, what's happening in this book? And I'm like, I don't know, but I've got a bunch of characters who are interesting to me and I'm 
trying to figure out what the plot is, you know, because that's just not my strength as a writer. That's just not what I'm good at. And if I were, I would probably make more money, uh, but that's just not what my talent is. I think my talent, what little bit I can claim is, is, is creating characters who feel real and urgent to me and then hoping that they'll complicate their lives in ways that will result in interesting stories. Um, and so that's what I feel like happened in this book. And it, and it ended up being a more traditional mystery in ways that surprised me, that I really can't take credit for. It just kind of happened. Definitely happened. It's definitely a page turner. I mean, you definitely have that the, the energy that to, to keep the reader on the go. Um, and I, those things that you mentioned from the early novels that, that propel themselves, certain components of your writing that we that we see here too. I, I especially like the, it's in all your work, there's this, this notion of secrets and secrets are going to bubble up. Mm -hmm. And, and in, in this book, in the new book, this, once again, we see an attempt to outrun the past. Mm -hmm. You know, we saw that in the, in the second book with Wade, mm -hmm. the dad, Wade, yep. trying to, Right, and we uh, our protagonist here, the sheriff Winston, mm -hmm. it is, and that that underlying tension, I think, is one of the, the things I enjoy most about the book. It's I wonder if those, like that, desire to outrun the past, is that a thing? I mean, were you aware that you were doing that as you had done before, or is that um, just stuck back in there? I think it's something that just kind of comes to me. I is part of creating characters that feel real. I think no matter who we are, there's things in our past where we're like, oh, that makes me uncomfortable, or I wish I hadn't said that, or I wish I hadn't done that. You know, I just mentioned things that we did in the neighborhood being built behind my house. I shudder to think like, oh yeah, we went in that house and smoked cigarettes, and then there was that little fire that time, or whatever, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, and I think now, especially having kids, you know, gosh, I hope they never sneak out. And I'm like, well, I snuck out and I'm alive. And that was fun. Gosh, how am I going to keep them from believing that's fun? Um, and so I think that all of us have things in our past. And, you know, maybe they're maybe they're greater than what I'm hinting at joking about. But they're, they involve, you know, uh, tragedy and trauma and isolation and uncertainty. Um, but I think all of us have things that, are, that feel, we feel like we're coming for us if we slow down enough that they'll find us. And that's just something that all, I think my characters will always have that. They'll always have these little, these little teeth of doubt nagging on the corners of their memory, you know? Um, and so, you know, yeah, but, but as far as this being um, a page turner, I really wanted it to be, I wanted it to be, and I appreciate you selling, saying that, Ellen, I really wanted it to be a novel where everything trampolines into the next chapter, where you find out a little bit of information and then you think, oh my gosh. But, you know, unlike my first two books um, that, were, that are sometimes discussed as being mysteries, the reader of those two novels, A Land More Kind Than Home and This Dark Road to Mercy, the reader has all of the information. And the mystery or whatever tension there is in the book comes from waiting to see when the characters are gonna have all of the information. Mm -hmm. And you think, oh my gosh, what is, what is you know, um, Clem gonna do when he knows the family's role in this? Or what is, what is Easter gonna do when she learns her father's true history? And you're waiting, because you know, right? Um, with, with when ghosts come home, the characters don't have all the information and the reader doesn't have all of the information. Each of the characters have private information that they're either hiding or aren't quite capable of synthesizing or in Colleen's case is trying to share but her dad's not interested in hearing it because he's got a very clear idea of what he thinks happened in this case and so that's why in this novel more than any other thing I've written it's a traditional mystery in that there are reveals there are twists there are turns there are things that surprise hopefully surprise the reader because they surprised me uh, when I was writing it Sure, for sure, for sure. You are a North Carolina writer. Do you ever envision yourself writing about people from elsewhere or setting elsewhere? I can't say that I won't. Um, 
or, or, or maybe putting characters from North Carolina somewhere else. I just don't know another place. You know, I don't, I, I just don't, I, I, I can't imagine that I will. Not because I, not because I don't want to. Um, I think that we all write to our strengths and our notions. And my strengths are dialogue, setting, and my notions are just North Carolina, you know. Uh, North Carolina is an interesting place because, you know, we have so much tension in the state. We've got regional tension. We've got these three very defined regions, the mountains, the Piedmont, and the coast. And we've got political tensions in the state. Um, we've got uh, class tensions. We've got sports tensions. We've got culinary tensions. Um, and it's interesting, and every four years, we don't know if we're blue or red or some shade or, you know. And so that's a good place to write from, because writers, we want tension. We, that's where stories come from. If you don't have any tension, you don't have a story. You just got events. This happened, and this happened, and this happened. But if you've got tension, you've got a story of how that tension came to be resolved or bubble over. Um, and so North Carolina just feels so relevant to me. And I think if you look at a lot of other southern states, the tension, I'm thinking oftentimes about, you know, Appalachian novels, especially someplace like West Virginia or Kentucky, a lot of the tension there is outsider insider. And, and I think North Carolina is one of the few states where you can have some real insider insider tension. And that kind of subverts the expectation of local color, because traditionally, 19th century local color, Mark Twain, Kate Chopin, Charles Chestnut, it's commonly about the outsider coming to the inside and trying to take something, whether it be people or natural resources or culture or music. Um, in North Carolina, having that insider versus insider tension is, is, is an interesting place to write from. All right, I'm gonna ask you one more question and then I'm going to ask you to read for us a little bit from the novel. But the question I want to ask has to do with just that, the, the, the most important tension of all, right. and you as a true son of North Carolina, could you please explain to us why it is that Bridges Barbecue <laughs> is the best <laughs> cue in Carolina? Oh gosh, so Bridges Barbecue is from Shelby, uh, North Carolina, Cleveland County. Um, my dad's from Shelby, so I'm a little bit uh, probably uh, jaded about it, but you know, barbecue is such a scandalous topic in, in Eastern North Carolina. We had, uh, you have, I mean, in North Carolina, you have all these different kinds. You've got the hickory smoked and the ketchup based in part, and then you've even got some mustard in parts, and then you've got the vinegar, tangy, spicy on the Eastern part of the state. Um, but, you know, I grew up eating British barbecue. It's kind of the, the hickory smoked, uh, ketchup based, kind of when you think of barbecue sauce, that's more in line with what it is. Um, but Ron Rash also says the same thing about Bridges Barbecue. He, do, he doesn't eat fried food, but he eats um, Bridges Hush Puppies, which are good. Um, but uh, uh, I remember Ron told me a story once, and y'all probably have heard this too, that he went to Bridges one day and the owner came out and said, Ron, people said that you were talking about Bridges Barbecue on NPR. And Ron said, I did. And, and the guy said, I didn't think anybody who came here listened to NPR. <laughs> uh, but yeah. You can thank Ron Rash for that question. <laughs> I emailed Ron a couple of days ago. Oh, he asked you to ask me that? Oh, I said, so throw me a good juicy bone to ask while we're going to be Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, Ron's from Bowling Springs, which is just right nearby Shelby. And um, and uh, one time I was doing a, an event at the at the library in Shelby, and um, I and Ron was going to be there a couple of months after me. I saw on their calendar, and uh, I told the audience, I said, I'm so glad um, that uh, I, I agreed to be Ron's opening act. <laughs> I said I'm like the uh, the acoustic band before Pink Floyd comes out. <laughs> takes the stage and after my event a woman came up to me and she said I just wanted to come introduce myself I'm Ron's mom and I said Ron who she said Ron Rash and I said you came to see me um, but I thought I would read a little bit uh, from the book just the first 75 pages um, perfect timing um, so this is a scene in the novel uh, there are three principal uh, characters in this novel the setup is 
Fall of 1984 on the coast of North Carolina, and a local sheriff is awakened in the middle of the night uh, by the sound of an aircraft passing low over his house. And he drives out to this municipal airfield. He knows there is no reason for an airplane of that size to be coming in this late at night. And he finds an abandoned DC-3, which is a World War II cargo plane. Um, it's crash landed, it's sitting sideways at the end of the runway, the rear landing gear is snapped off, and it's completely empty. Later they'll process the plane and they won't be able to find any fingerprints inside the aircraft. And then alongside the runway in the grass is the body of a local man who's been shot dead and left behind. And the sheriff is one of our, our principal characters, as is his daughter. Her name's Colleen. She's 25 years old. Uh, she was raised uh, on the coast there. And she has returned. She is fleeing a rocky young marriage and a tragedy. She has lost a child. Her, her son was stillborn. So she and her husband have recently moved to Dallas, and she cannot bear the pain of um, her tragedy or the awkwardness and discomfort of the marriage, and so she has just decided to, to surprise her parents and come back home. And uh, there is also a young man, uh, a young black man from Atlanta. Uh, his name is Jay. He's 14 years old. He's been sent up to the country in eastern North Carolina by his parents down in Atlanta. He's gotten into some trouble, as young, young kids oftentimes do, and his parents fear that he's running with the wrong crowd, so they send him up to, to live with his perfect sister, who's 26 years old, and her perfect new husband, and their perfect newborn baby, and Jay arrives just in time for his brother-in-law to be found dead uh, on that runway, and so um, I wanted to read a scene where Colleen has, this is the, the morning after Colleen has come home, she stayed up a little bit too late, drinking a little bit too much of her dad's old Milwaukee, and she and her mother are on the way to the grocery store. And uh, they have learned that the FBI has gotten involved in the investigation of this aircraft. And they're sending in a pilot, an FBI agent who's also a pilot from Florida, to fix this aircraft and to fly it off this runway. And because it's the off season and it's a tiny little coastal town, uh, there are no hotels open and the pilot is going to be staying with them. And uh, they are going to the grocery store to get food for their guest. And uh, like mothers and daughters often do, they've gotten into a little argument on the way to the grocery store. Colleen wants to come home to lick her wounds, but like many of us do when we go home, we find that old wounds are there waiting for us. <laughs> and uh, this is, uh, this is a, a sad scene, but it's also a funny scene, because I, I, I feel like I get accused of writing kind of dark, depressing books, but I think my books are sometimes kind of funny as well. And you don't, have, uh, you don't have humor if you don't have a little bit of tragedy. Uh, if you think of the funniest thing you've ever seen, it's probably somebody falling down. And the person who <laughs> fell down probably doesn't think it was, doesn't think it was very funny. Um, so I want to dedicate this to my friend Newland, who's here with her mother-in-law, not her mother. Because y'all would never have this interaction, because you seem like a decent person. I'm decent. Um, so uh, let's see here. So Colleen has gone into the grocery store. She and her mother it immediately split up, uh, and, and uh, Colleen um, is a little hungover. That's all you need to know. When she reached the end of the aisle and turned left to round another, she spotted a woman at the far end pushing a young baby in a stroller. Colleen recognized her immediately. It was Myra Page, a girl she'd been friends with in high school but had hardly seen since they both left home for college. Myra didn't see her, and Colleen stood for a moment, watching the baby in the stroller, who looked to be a little boy. He was chewing on something as if his teeth hurt. And Colleen tried to gaze his age, but something in her stomach turned, and she suddenly feared that she was going to vomit right there on the floor. She spun away from Myra toward the meat counter, where great slabs of steaks and ground hamburgers set on crushed ice behind thick glass. She tried to remember the layout of the store, to recall where the restrooms were. She scanned the back wall for a sign, and then she saw it on her left and made a beeline for it. She was barely able to close the stall door and lift the lid of the toilet seat before, I'll spare you, spare you the details, she coughed, spit what was left in her mouth into the water. She flushed the toilet and grabbed a fistful of toilet paper and dabbed at her face and her neck. She opened the stall door and walked to the sink. She ran the water and splashed it over her face, cupped some of it into her mouth, swished and spit it out. Her pale face stared at her from the mirror 
and she winced at the dark circles under her eyes. Her blonde hair still looked damp where she'd pulled it back in the stubby ponytail. Her pocketbook was in her mother's shopping cart, so she didn't have anything with her. No lip gloss, no brush, nothing to improve what she was seeing before her. She pinched her cheeks to bring color back into them, gave herself a few light slaps. She opened her mouth, smiled gruesomely. <laughs> Outside the bathroom, Colleen saw that Myra Page had reached the end of the aisle and was now standing by the butcher's counter, a woman beside her. To her great horror, Colleen discovered that the woman with Myra was her own mother, and she was holding Myra's baby in her arms. Her fingers clasping the teething toy and passing it in and out of the baby's mouth while its flailing arms reached for it. Myra and her mother were both laughing. Both women looked up and saw Colleen at the same time. Her mother smiled a smile that looked like elation to Colleen. Myra simply waved as if she and Colleen were still girlfriends. Myra, as if remembering Myra, as if remembering or intuiting the great upheaval of Colleen's life, cocked her head to the side and looked at Colleen as if she were a child. And how are you? She asked once Colleen was close enough. Now you're in, she paused as if trying to remember something. Texas now, right? Yeah, Colleen said. Dallas, my husband took a job there. Wow. Myra said, I bet it's really beautiful out there. It's nice, Colleen said. She tried to smile, tried to keep her eyes off Myra's baby boy. It's growing on me. Well, now she's home visiting her mama, <laughs> Colleen's mother said, rocking her body and the baby from side to side at the word mama. She laughed a little and looked at Colleen. Her face changed. Are you okay? she asked. Colleen nodded her head and did her best to smile. Honey, did you just throw up? <laughs> Colleen was crying by the time they made it out to the car. Her mother sat in the passenger seat while Colleen lifted the paper bags full of groceries into the trunk. When she was finished, she slammed its closed and left the cart sitting where it was. She pulled her shirt sleeves over her hands and wiped her eyes and then she opened the driver's door and climbed inside. She started the engine and backed out of the space without looking at her mother. I'm sorry, her mother said. I don't know what I was thinking. It's okay, Colleen said. She sniffed, wiped at her eyes again. I wasn't thinking at all, her mother said. I just saw Myra and I didn't think a thing about holding her baby. I just forgot. Forgot what? Colleen asked. They had come to a stop at a red light before leaving the parking lot and turning on to Beach Road. Forgot that I was with you? Forgot that I lost my son? Forgot that you lost your grandson? I don't know, Colleen, she said. Maybe, maybe for a minute, I forgot to be sad. Her face broke and she closed her eyes. Colleen knew she was fighting tears. She had rarely seen her mother cry and seeing it now surprised her. Colleen reached out and closed her hand over her mother's. It's okay, she said. I'm not mad. I'm definitely not mad at you. I'm just sad, and I know you are too, and it, it just is what it is. The light turned green, and Colleen eased onto the gas and turned out of the parking lot. They rode in silence for a moment. I shouldn't have held that stupid baby, her mother finally said. Colleen smiled and looked over at her. It did look stupid, didn't it, she said. Her mother smiled too. Yeah, it did, it looked pretty stupid. <laughs> Colleen laughed, she reached for the radio. Stupid baby, she said. <laughs> you talk too much more about the book itself because you're telling everything. <laughs> There's lots of surprises in there. We like to talk about Pat Conroy around here. One of the many, many awards that you have been given for your writing is the Southern Independent Booksellers Association Pat Conroy Legacy Award in 2020, which is a, a big deal. I mean, well, all the awards. But that one in particular is a really 
big deal and it's for a body of work and for a writer who embraces his home place, her home place, a writer who is a good literary citizen, a, a, it's, a writer, it's for a writer beyond just the words on the page. Pat Conroy was such an incredible mentor to, to people who increasingly are coming in, in the door and so many others. But will you talk about, well, that award in particular, but what it's like to be the, the hot shot of mm -hmm. American Southern letters these days? Well, if you find the hot shot, let me know. I'll ask. <laughs> I'll ask. I wish to call my wife and tell her, you know, your, your husband's the hot shot. She'd be like, who is this? Did he put you up to this? Um, you know, when I found out I was going to win that award, it was a little bit embarrassing um, because I, at the time I only had three books. And, you know, to have anything associated with Pat Conroy's name, period, as a writer, is daunting. And um, especially at that point, it felt even more so. It felt more like um, an invitation to become uh, the literary citizen, the, the representative of, of home, instead of um, uh, a, an award for having been or for continuing to be. And so I, I see it as, as an invitation as much as I do a, a citation, to be honest with you. Um, but you know, Pat Conroy was one of the writers when I was trying to figure out what kind of writer I wanted to be who wrote about home in a way that resonated with me. You know, when I was in college at, at UNC Asheville, where, where I'm very fortunate to be back teaching, Southern writers weren't part of the literary canon, well, contemporary Southern writers. You know, I might have read William Faulkner, I might have read Flannery O'Connor. Uh, I'd never been to Mississippi. I didn't, I'd never been to, well, I've been to Georgia to see Braves games, but I've never <laughs> been to, uh, I didn't know that many Catholic people. Um, when, actually, when, I, when my first novel came out, US, USA Today interviewed me like an hour long phone interview. They were going to do a profile. And I talked for an hour, and then they, they published the interview. I read the profile and it said, name, Wiley Cash, book, a land more kind than home, release date, da 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 da, da. Quote, I never met a Catholic person until I moved to Louisiana. <laughs> and that was all they quoted me as saying. <laughs> um, I just eat mayonnaise sandwiches in North Carolina. <laughs> they had all that voodoo down there and surprised me. Um, but there weren't a lot of Southern writers, you know, like Ron wasn't, publishing a lot, Cold Mountain hadn't come out, um, but everybody knew who Pat Conroy was. Um, he was one of those few Southern writers in the 80s and 90s and, and, and today who had a national reputation that a young writer could get their hands on. Um, and so, you know, reading something like Prince of Tides and then knowing that he loved Thomas Wolfe and I love Thomas Wolfe, um, there was just that, that connection of, well, if he's done it, maybe I can do it. You know, and, and it made everything seem possible. And then when you would meet him, it made it seem more possible because he would help you make it possible, you know, and, and give you the, the strength to think that it was. I remember the first time I met him, it was at the South Carolina Book Festival in Columbia, which was such a wonderful book festival. Um, I had a chance to meet so many heroes there. Um, but Jonathan, uh, uh, who was such a connector of people said, you know, I gave, I gave Pat uh, the Stark Road to Mercy. And I thought, well, that, I, I'm sure I said, well, thank you, Jonathan. Then I, my next thought was like, he's not going to read that. Um, and so we were like in the author's green room or some part of the festival. And, and, and Pat came in and I was aware that he was there because like you're always aware of the sun. That's kind of what it was like. But I wasn't gonna go up and say like, you know, there's a bunch of people here who wanna talk to you and I'm, I went. And so I just thought, you know, I'll meet him eventually. I hadn't met him yet. And um, there's a scene in the book where um, uh, baseball signs like, you know, 
are, are used in the book. And somebody called out my name and I looked over and Pat Conroy was giving me baseball signs. And for a second I thought, what's that man doing? And then I was like, oh my gosh, I guess he read my book. And he had, and uh, I couldn't believe it. He came up to me and we talked and it, it just made me feel so relieved that I wasn't gonna have to pursue him, that he was willing, I mean, I was a nobody, you know, I was a nobody. And he came up and talked to me. And he said, so what are y'all doing? And, and my wife was pregnant and uh, she was with us. And so of course he was very kind to her and just kind of, you know, doting on her. And he said, um, what are y'all doing after this? Like, what, what, what's, what's your summer look like? And I said, well, we're going down to, um, we're going down to Hilton Head for a little vacation after this, for last vacation before the baby comes. And he said, well, come to Beaufort. We'll have lunch one day. We'll, we'll get Sandy. We'll go out and have lunch and all of this. And I thought, oh, he is so kind. He's going to forget that invitation as soon as I leave this room. So we go down to Hilton Head and uh, I had left my phone in the room. We're like out on the beach and we're reading and I go back to my room one day and uh, there's a phone message and it says, Wiley, this is Pat Conroy, we having lunch or not? <laughs> and uh, so we went and had lunch and we had such a beautiful, that was the, the first uh, amount of time that I got to spend with, with um, him and Sandy and it was just such a wonderful time. And something that I'll never forget is, you know, oftentimes, especially with writers, there's an instant connection because we're so solitary. We don't get to spend a lot of time together. Like I met you once and I remembered exactly where it was because I'm like, oh, writer. Um, and so we make these fast friendships and there's an intensity to them. And oftentimes my wife, Mallory, who is a photographer and an artist in her own right, can feel a little bit outside of that sometimes especially if somebody is uh, meeting me and we're like at a festival and the host takes you out, it oftentimes is like the, the Wiley Cash interview hour and Mallory eats her dinner. And it, she doesn't complain, it doesn't bother her, but I notice it because I love her and I. But this was a lunch where we were taken out and invited to participate into a, in a conversation. And I just remember how often he was like, now Mallory, where are you from? What did you grow up doing? What did, what did you major in? Oh, you went to South Carolina. And it was just one of the first times that I can really remember, and it was early on in my career, where we both had lunch, where we both were included in an experience. And I just never forgot that. I just never forgot that. Um, and when we found out that, that, that Pat had passed, that's what we talked about, you know, was was um, the kindness outside of the writing community, you know, was the kindness he shared. So that was a big deal to, to win that award, um, especially winning it from the Southern Independent Booksellers Alliance, which is, that's my people, you know, Southern Independent Bookstores, Nevermore Books and uh, other, other stores, I mean, they gave me a career. If this book had been launched into the Amazon stratosphere, nobody would have read my book, no one. They wouldn't have known about it. Um, this is my first novel was a hand sell novel. And um, so to be recognized by them and, and, and Pat's name is a big deal for me. Alliance, I said association, I know that. I say association sometimes too. <laughs> well, we have nearly, I have, well, I have this whole set, this always happens. I have all these questions that we didn't get around to. But before we close out the hour, I would imagine that there must be a burning question or two out there that you would like to ask Wiley. You can certainly ask him questions when we're signing books, but if you've got something you think everybody would enjoy hearing the answer to, let's hear it. Question? Anybody? <laughs> Stranger in the Lady in the front row. <laughs> Do you think you'll keep writing Southern fiction? Like, what are you working on? Are you gonna, you know, stay in this world? I mean, I hope so. Yeah, she, she asked if I'm gonna keep writing Southern fiction. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's just because that's what I know. You know, I mean, it's what I know, it's what I'm interested in. And I'm interested in all these complications and all these representations of the past or representations, all these symbols, all this stuff. 
And so I'm at work on another novel. Um, it'll be out in 15 years. Um, that's when our, that's when our uh, youngest leaves home. Um, although our five-year-old says, I'm never leaving home. And I say, that is fine with me, you little nugget of sweet purity. You never have to leave home. Our seven-year-old one day woke up for school. This was before she was even in school. This might have been. And she woke up and she said, Daddy, I'm never going to get to move to New York City. I said, oh, my. You are going to fit in when you get there. One day she came into the kitchen and fell to her knees and said, a bird's never going to land on my hand. Um, but... Uh, the book I'm working on now, uh, Patty, is, um, it's set in 2018, uh, back on the Cape Fear, in the Cape Fear region, actually on the river, and uh, it's um, set in the days after the Silent Sam statue at Carolinas toppled, and it's about, um, you know, memory and um, signifiers of memory um, and climate change. Uh, my editor doesn't know that part yet. Uh, you know, the, the book that I pitched him, he's like, I don't, I don't know if that will work or not. And so I pitched him a slightly different book, and he's like, oh, that's great, but it's the same. It's the same. <laughs> he doesn't know that yet. Is this live? Are we online? He's not watching this. I don't make enough money for him to watch this. Um, the first time I did a, a virtual event was Jonathan set up, it was at uh, the Southern Festival of Books, and we did uh, a virtual thing with Radney Foster uh, for, my, for my novel, The Last Ballad. So Zoom, Facebook Live, whatever, Pat Conroy Center was doing it before anybody else back in 2017. So any, anyone else have any questions? Yes, ma'am. Tell us about your students uh, that you're teaching, what classes you're teaching, where they're from, what you're learning from them. That's a great question. Uh, so I teach at UNC Asheville. I am the alumni author in residence. What that means is I am not tenure track. So every three years I say, do you want to keep doing this? And they say, do you want to keep doing this? And I say, well, you pay my health insurance, so I kind of have to keep doing this. Um, so this semester I'm teaching two classes. I'm teaching a fiction writing workshop on, on Monday nights. Uh, my students in that class are pretty good. Um, I've had some brilliant writers at UNCA that, that I've gone on to publish, um, gone to great graduate programs. Um, this semester, I'm requiring that my students write about home, which frustrated them at first. And um, I told them, many of y'all came into this class thinking you had to write a novel set in New York to write a novel worth publishing, but you've never been to New York. Um, so you can't write truthfully about that place. But everything that's ever broken your heart or buoyed your heart has happened at home. Um, so we're writing stories based on home, and we're also reading the work by uh, published writers who are writing about home. So every week, we come in having read the same story by Krista Wilkinson. We're reading an excerpt from The Birds of Opulence for class on Monday and a student writes a craft essay, and we talk about it. Um, sometimes the authors will join us. Uh, S.A. Cosby, um, who wrote Razor Blade Tears and um, uh, Blacktop Wasteland, uh, joined us our first class. He writes about uh, Southeast Virginia, and my students got to talk to him, and he said, y'all need to write about home. You know, that's, that's what gave me a career. Um, and so that's what we're doing in my in my fiction workshop, and uh, that's been really wonderful. Um, it's 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 amazing to see students realize that the tensions they're learning about in their humanities classes are also happening in their hometowns. Um, and then I'm teaching a lit class this semester on Tuesday and Thursday morning. It's uh, a class in ethnic horror. And I know what you're thinking. He is the ideal person to teach that class. <laughs> um, but uh, a departing faculty member had organized this class, and it was full, and the students were really, really excited about it. A particularly beloved faculty member. And my department head said, you know, it would mean a lot to the department if you could step in and fill this, because, you know, you kind of have a special circumstance, and, and it would just be good if you did this. And I said, okay. And so I got to choose my own syllabus. And uh, I chose um, all living writers 
who have written contemporary works of ethnic horror, and they've all joined us via Zoom. And so we've read um, Only Good Indians by Stephen Graham Jones, Ruman Alam's Leave the World Behind, which was a National Book Award finalist last year. We read Jason Mott's new novel, uh, Hell of a Book. He's a National Book Award finalist this year. Um, Shelter by Joan Yoon, uh, a book that just came out called Reprieve by James Hahn Madsen. And the students have gotten to spend 30 minutes to an hour with all of these authors after we read the book, peppering them with questions and asking them all of this stuff. And so it's been a pretty amazing class. And uh, what I've learned about this class is how essential genre fiction is in addressing historical events. And the way I frame this class is that horror and, and hauntings especially, uh, cultural hauntings, result from something being left undone. And uh, that's how we framed all the discussions of the books that we've read. And what's been really interesting is the class is in person on Tuesday morning and virtual on Thursday morning. And um, on Thursdays, we either have an author join us or my students do what I'm calling jumping off presentations where they jump off the book into whatever direction they want to take it. And so, for example, we read a novel by uh, a writer named Ling Ma called Severance. It's a, it's a zombie novel. But it's all about memory and nostalgia and how products oftentimes represent nostalgic memories for us. And um, I had students talk about nostalgia and capitalism. I had, I had one student jump off into a discussion and a, and a visual presentation of how different types of marketing makes us nostalgic for times that we were not participants in. And so my student who's 21 years old is talking about her love for vinyl <laughs> and her willingness to pay outlandish amounts of money for contemporary bands that release vinyl albums on this record player she owns that's made to look like it came from the 1970s. And then she talked about mid-century modern furnishings and homes and all of this stuff. And it just, I was, my mouth was hanging open at the end of it thinking, how did you get there from this zombie novel? But she did, and it was amazing. And so, you know, virtual, virtual education has been a, a boon to my experience of this class because it lets the students share their screens, it lets them show video. You can do that in person, but the glitchiness of technology adds a layer of stress to that. And when the student is sitting in their bedroom at home giving a presentation, they are completely relaxed. They are in their element. It, it's just been, it's been wonderful. Um, and to have them interact with these writers, um, and also be able to talk to writers about the literary value of their, not value, but the literary you know, components of their work, and then the craft-based components of their work, because a lot of my students are writers, so they get to ask Jason Mott about his process. You know, what was your process in writing this book? And, um, and, and it's just been cool, it's been wonderful. Yes, sir. How did you become a writer and uh, follow up what point did you feel comfortable, confident, calling yourself a writer? Gosh, uh, I, I don't. I think I, I. I always wanted to write. You know, I always wanted to write or play basketball. <laughs> and when I, I've been this height since like the seventh grade. So in the seventh grade, it seemed possible. Um, but when I found out I wasn't, I'm teasing. But uh, I always liked to read. I grew up around storytellers. I was always a reader. We grew up playing in the woods, shooting basketball, shooting BB guns, and I read. And when it was raining, like a day like today, I would read. We didn't have, I grew up in the years just before video games. And so I never played video games. I just wasn't into it. Now, some of my friends did play video games in college or high school, and I just never did that. I always would read if it was raining and I couldn't go outside. Um, and I was just the kind of person that if I was, if I was interested in something, I would try to do it. Um, and that's how I started trying to write. I originally thought I was gonna be a poet, 
because I listened to The Doors and I wanted to meet girls. <laughs> and I thought Jim Morrison was the greatest poet of all time. And I went to college and realized that he wasn't and neither was I. And so I stopped writing poetry, but I liked, I liked writing and I, I began writing stories. And I went to UNC Asheville because they had a degree in creative writing. This was one of the, back in the days when not a lot of schools did. It's a literature-based creative writing degree. And, um, and so I don't know when I began calling myself a writer. You know, I don't know if there was a magic moment. Um, but, or, or thinking of myself in that way. You know, I hear a lot of people say, well, I won't be a writer until I get something published. Um, and that just feels like prolonging identity, you know, and we've got enough of that. So, you know, call yourself whatever you would like uh, or, feel, or, feel, or feel led to. But, you know, I don't know that I'll always do it. You know, it's such a tenuous career, you know, and I'm not John Grisham. I'm not J.K. Rowling or Toni Morrison or I don't, I don't pass like the mom test. Like if every mom in America knows who you are, you're famous, <laughs> but that's not me, you know. Um, if, I, if my mom wasn't my mom, my mom wouldn't know who I was. But my mom knows all of those writers, you know. Um, and, but you might know who I am because of my mom. I meet so many people who are like, I met your mom at the farmer's market. And my mom's a painter. Uh, and um, they're like, she had your book and she sold it to me. Um, there was a point where my mom had sold more copies of my first novel than the Barnes & Noble book. Um, and then they would be shooting a movie down where she lives and she would like sneak on set and give the, pic the, the book to like whoever the star was and take a picture and then sneak back off. Um, but, I, but I don't know that I'll always do this. And, uh, and so in the back of my mind, I, I constantly think, what am I gonna do if this stops? You know, I, I'm not, I don't just write, I teach, but I teach because I've been a successful author. I'm, I'm not much value to the university if my books don't sell. Um, or at least my value would be teaching composition and six classes a year instead of one. Um, and so I don't, I don't know what the future holds for me uh, in terms of a career, and, and I don't know exactly when I began thinking of myself as a writer, but sometimes I don't introduce myself as that because the questions are tough. You know, if you say, what do you do? I'm a pharmacist. Nobody says like, what's your favorite drug to mix? <laughs> what's your favorite compound, chemical compound? But when you say you're a writer, they say, have I ever heard of you? Yeah. And you're like, no. Well, what have you, what have you written? And you tell the title, that's a long title. I know, it's a long title. Um, where can I find your books? Wherever books are sold. Not Amazon, please don't look up Amazon right now. Um, and so I, I usually just say I teach. When people ask me, what, what do you do? I say I teach. And then my mom goes, he's the New York Times bestselling writer. <laughs> and they say, they say, have I heard of you? And I say, I say my name, like, gosh, you'd think I, you would have heard of you if you New York Times bestseller. <laughs> Jason Mott, in his new book, he says, you're only as good as your Google results. Because oh, he says people will Google him in front of him. And say, oh, okay, you've, okay, you're real. You're legit then. You're on the airplane. Um, so. I go to ratemypharmacist.com to sniff out the frauds when I meet them, or rate my lawyer or whatever. Um, we know Ron Rash could get you a job at Bridges Park. That's, yeah. <laughs> That's true. That's yeah. true. Wally Cash, we love having you in the Low Country. Please come visit us. Thank you all for coming out. Um, and we'll sign books and get ready for the next extravaganza. <laughs>